Buenas tardes. Para esta presentación contaremos con los servicios de interpretación al español en simultáneo. Si usted desea escuchar esta presentación en español, en unos minutos usted podrá observar en la barra de herramientas en la parte inferior de su pantalla el icono de un globo terráqueo. Al seleccionar este icono, va a tener un menú con los idiomas de preferencia. Seleccione el español y podrá escucharme. Escucharme. Albert, I'm ready to be added as interpreter. In just a moment, I'm going to hand it over to the league to take over for the program. But before I do that, I do want to talk a little bit about the library's resources and services. The Contra Costa County Library is happy to connect you with our resources, services, and materials at all 26 of our branches. Access more than 1 million physical items, including international language collections, and thousands of digital materials 24-7 at cccLIB.org. Visit any library to use our public computers, printers, and free Wi-Fi. You can also visit one of our branches with laptops for on-site use or check out a Wi-Fi hotspot for three weeks. Contra Costa County Library's adult literacy program trains and supports volunteer tutors to deliver basic literacy instruction to adults throughout the county. Visit our website and sign up for a digital library card today. Okay, I'm gonna now hand it over to Susan Hildreth to take over for today's program. Albert, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Susan Hildreth, and on behalf of the Contra Costa County Library, the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, and the League of Women Voters West Contra Costa and Contra Costa County TV, welcome to our Community Conversation webinar, Deportation and the Courts, Promoting Human Rights at Home. Before we begin, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. As we know, this is a Zoom webinar, so the audience microphones are muted and the videos are turned off of the audience. If you have any questions for our moderator or panelist, please submit them using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. A member of our team will share your questions with the moderator during the Q&A portion of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and at the end of the program, it will be posted to the YouTube channels of the Contra Costa County Library and the League of Women Voters Diablo Valley. Site addresses for those YouTube channels will be displayed on screen at the end of the program. Additionally, Contra Costa Television is broadcasting this webinar today and will rebroadcast the program. The dates and times will be posted on your screen at the end of the webinar. Contra Costa Television is available to watch on Comcast, on Channel 27, AT&T UVerse, Channel 99, Astound Panelists, uh, oops, Astound Channel 32, and online at ContraCostaTV.org. The contact information for our panelists and the date and the subject of our next community conversation will also be shown at the end of the program. The, we the League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan grassroots organization working to protect and expand voting rights and ensure everyone is represented in our democracy. We empower voters and defend democracy through advocacy, education, and litigation at the local, state, and national levels. The League of Women Voters of the United States believes that democratic government depends upon informed and active participation at all levels of government. We invite you to join the League of Women Voters and support our work. You can join the League by visiting us at the site on the screen. The League's statement of position on immigration is this. The League of Women Voters believes that immigration policies should promote reunification of immediate families, meet the economic, business, and employment needs of the United States, and be responsive to those facing political persecution or humanitarian crises. Provision should also be made for qualified persons to enter the United States on student visas. All persons should receive fair treatment under the law. The League supports federal immigration law that provides an efficient, expeditious system with minimal or no backlogs for legal entry of immigrants into the United States. It is now my pleasure to introduce our moderator, Ali Sadi. 
For over 20 years, Ali has been using both litigation and policy advocacy to fight for community members dehumanized by our systems of mass incarceration and mass deportation. He specializes in an anti-racist approach to the intersection between criminal law and immigration law. In 2016, he spearheaded an advocacy campaign which led to the creation of the county's Rapid Response and Immigration Legal Services Program, Stand Together Contra Costa, um, of which he now serves as a director. In addition to his service at the Contra Costa County Public Defender's Office, Ali is a founding and active member of the Contra Costa Immigrant Rights Alliance, where he serves on the Internal Coordination Committee. He is also the founding member of Contra Costa County Reimagine Public Safety Campaign. So we're handing it over to Ali. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here again uh, with the League of Women Voters. Uh, we had an opportunity uh, late last year to uh, have an initial conversation um, about immigration. And uh, of course, it was very timely. And we were uh, smart enough to know that these issues were going to continue to be complex uh, and be front of mind. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, start a short PowerPoint presentation for you all. There we go. Okay, let's see. Is... Oops. How are we looking there? Looking good. Great. Good Thank you so there. much. <laughs> um, so what I really want to talk about today is how do we connect what's going on internationally and at the federal national level with what's going on right here in Contra Costa County? And what are ways that we as Californians, as Americans, and as Contra Costa residents, what ways can we tap in to help promote and support human rights right here at home? So as you may know, uh, a new deportation court opened uh, here in our community in Concord, California uh, last month uh, on February 12th. The picture in the upper right-hand corner uh, is a picture of uh, some community members that were there during a press conference to uh, advocate for increased legal services and also to make sure that community members whose cases were being transferred to this location would be able to understand uh, where their case is transferred to and if their case, of, case dates have been changed. Um, so with this, this is representing a really, really big expansion in the deportation capacity of the Bay Area. This location, you can see the picture in the lower right-hand corner. You can see those two kind of triangular shaped buildings in the, in the front there. Uh, the one in the lower right-hand corner is where the new deportation court is located. Um, and the uh, Department of Justice uh, ultimately has plans to create 21 new immigration courtrooms there in the Concord Court. Um, they are operational currently, but they only have 10 of the courtrooms actually being um, occupied by so-called immigration judges at this stage. Um, this is a good time to pause for a second and kind of explain what a deportation court actually is um, and what happens at these places. So first of all, it's an important thing to know that this location is not an ICE detention facility. So ICE, which is the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, uh, that work closely with the Customs and Border Patrol are the enforcement arm um, of the federal government's uh, efforts at dealing with immigration enforcement through the Department of Homeland Security. ICE will not have an office here. This is not a detention center. Uh, immigrants and migrants will not be detained at this location. What this location is, is a location where they are processing deportation cases. Those are cases where the federal government is charging an individual that is present in the United States with forcible removal from the United States. Uh, and that is what gets processed at these locations. Now, why do you see me keep using quotey fingers uh, when I say courts and courtrooms? Well, that's for a very basic reason. Um, it's because in my experience as a uh, immigration attorney, 
I know that most people uh, in the United States don't really understand the differences between a deportation court and uh, the other courts that we're used to seeing. So I want to describe that for you briefly. First and foremost, uh, I can tell you, I was shocked when I first walked into an immigration court um, because I had actually started my legal career as a public defender. Uh, I'm still a public defender, but I was doing criminal law at that point. And, you know, that's probably kind of like what you see on TV, although TV always gets it wrong too. But, you know, you have a, uh, first of all, you have a judge, you have an independent judiciary, right? We know that in the United States, we have separation of powers. We have three branches of government. We have the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branches of government. But what's really interesting about these so-called deportation courts is that they are not part of the judicial branch of government. So we don't have a separation of powers. Actually, these deportation courts are part of the executive branch. They're part of the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice. And these judges are not independent magistrates. So they can be given things like quotas, they can be given things like restrictions on whether they're allowed to speak with the press, um, and they are given these things. Um, actually, currently, there's there's a little bit of a, a scandal going on where uh, the president of the immigration judges union um, is quite upset because the federal government is trying to have immigration judges not be able to speak uh, with the media without it basically going through um, higher ups in in that area. So again, you can see that that whole concept of separation of powers uh, doesn't exist in deportation courts. The other thing that a lot of people don't know, um, and again, you'll note that I'm calling this a deportation court. Uh, that's because that's what happens here. That's what they're processing. What they do with these deportation courts is they determine whether or not the government's claim that the person should be deported is going to be followed through or not. You don't get a jury in these deportation courts, unlike you know, if you go to court for a criminal matter or a civil case, you can demand your right to a jury to determine the facts of the case. Um, well, you don't have that right in immigration court or deportation court. Again, it's the judge um, who, again, isn't an independent Article I of the Constitution judge that is the final arbiter of what's going on. Um, also, the federal rules of evidence don't apply uh, in immigration court. And so it's a very complicated system to navigate. The other thing that you should know about deportation court is that the laws of the United States around immigration are very, very complicated. Um, I, when I When I left doing criminal defense and I went to start doing immigration law, it really took me quite a while to, to gain expertise in it because uh, it is quite a complex area of law, and uh, the legal community basically says that uh, besides the tax code, there's no other kind of code or area of law that's more complex than immigration. Which brings us to the final and the most uh, jarring difference between what you might think should be in place in a court but really isn't, and that is the right to counsel if one cannot afford one. Uh, we've all, you know, seen television and all of that. You might be familiar uh, with something called the Miranda rights. Um, and ultimately, the right for someone in the United States, if they're charged with a crime to and they can't afford an attorney to be appointed one free of charge in order to present and defend their case. Unfortunately, in deportation court, that right doesn't exist. So you do have the right to have an attorney, but only, um, if you can either pay for one or secure one through nonprofits or other pro bono services, the government will not pay for you to have an attorney if you can't afford one like they do in criminal court. And what this means is that the vast majority of people that are dealing with these immigration cases that I explained to you is very, very complex, uh, don't have access to attorneys because they're indigent. Uh, and so there is a gigantic resource gap in the country around representation rates in these deportation hearings. And so um, we'll talk about that a little bit more. 
Uh, but locally, let's talk about this deportation court real fast. Um, what does it mean for us? Um, well, locally, what it means is that the plan is for the deportation capacity of the Bay Area to be nearly doubled, okay? This deportation court is going to be handling um, cases that cover everybody that lives or has um, zip codes in Contra Costa, about half of the folks in Alameda County, as well as uh, folks from Solano County, as well as folks from uh, the Central Valley, from several other counties ranging from down from the city of Bakersfield up through Fresno and so forth. So they're gonna be handling uh, lots and lots of cases. Um, and about a third of the cases that are currently pending in San Francisco are going to be transferred to this deportation court in Concord. And that's already been happening. And yet individuals that are subject to these changes in where their case is going to be heard, many of them haven't even gotten their notices yet that their case has been changed. Um, and not only has the location of many of these cases been changed, but the dates in almost all of the cases that I've seen have been changed. Some have moved up kind of forward in time by months and months and months and others have been moved back. So it's a very confusing situation for migrants that are trying to navigate the system. Um, and now that they're bringing this court here and it's opened, it's, it's operating, but it's not fully up to capacity yet. As I mentioned, they only have fewer than half of the uh, so-called judges set up uh, and they're not starting to process brand new cases there until June. Um, and we'll talk more about what the community responses are and our plans for gearing up and being ready for Junar uh, a little bit later in, um, in the presentation. But that is what's happening right here in our community. Um, and as the director of Stand Together Contra Costa, which is our county's uh, rapid response and legal services program, uh, although we've fought really hard with many of your help to uh, create some good pro bono resources for our community members that are facing these deportation courts to have free attorneys. I'm very proud to say Contra Costa County does fund some of those services. Uh, I have funding here at the Public Defender's Office uh, for four attorneys internal to the Public Defender's Office. And then we also have grants to local nonprofits including Jewish Family Community Services and the Immigration Institute of the Bay Area and Faith in Action East Bay to provide services. But at the end of the day, I have six deportation defense lawyers and there are over 13,000 cases, deportation cases for just Contra Costa residents alone that are pending. And these numbers are growing, which we'll talk about in a minute. In the past 90 days alone, there's been over 1,000 new deportation cases filed against Contra Costa residents. So I wanted to zoom out for a second because that can seem really, really heavy. And we need to put what's happening locally in the context of what's happening internationally and nationally. So I want to zoom out a little bit. Um, what you see on the left there is uh, an original uh, photograph from when the Universal of Declaration of Human Rights was first passed. Um, and that eventually, this was after World War II, and this led eventually to the creation of the Refugee Convention, the International Refugee Convention in 1951. This international regime of human rights and refugee law was created based on the lessons that we learned from World War II from uh, the mass displacement of people, not only as a result of the Holocaust, but as a result of war all across the world. Um, and there was a serious situation of humanitarian displacement happening at a scale that had never been seen before. And the countries of the world and the United Nations got together and said, you know what? We need to make sure that we all agree as the countries of the world to play by a certain set of rules when someone comes to us and asks for refuge, that asks for asylum. 
And so uh, eventually the United States in 1967 did sign this treaty. And so we are bound by this treaty obligation to provide human rights. And as you can see in the sign here, refugee rights are human rights. Um, and so we learned those lessons, those hard lessons that, that took so many people away um, and brought the entire planet to the brink of fascism. Um, and yet today we're seeing a situation where that pattern is repeating itself and yet we haven't remembered those lessons. Um, instead of looking at this as a humanitarian crisis and as an opportunity for us as Americans to lead in terms of showing our values of, um, of welcoming, of belonging, of due process, of human rights, uh, we are unfortunately seeing an increase in xenophobia and fear mongering. I'm sure you've seen the news of, um, you know, describing a crisis at the border and describing these asylum seeking families as invaders. Um, you know, you've heard all kinds of rhetoric, uh, not, you know, from, from lots of folks in government, uh, not just the right wing of the government, uh, really kind of eroding the very concept of asylum as a human right. And as an immigrant myself, um, I, I really do feel like it's important at this stage, this is why I wanted to do the zoom out slide, to make sure that we're keeping how we respond, both here in Contra Costa County and at the border, um, that we're thinking about that with a zoomed out view of both the history of our planet um, and the direction of where we want to go as a country. The American dream is really an immigrant dream as well. And if you've ever you know, spent time with immigrants, you'll see that immigrants are among the most courageous, most um, positive, hopeful, um, can-do people on the planet. And what the asylum seekers and immigrants that have risked their lives and out of all the places in the world that they could go have tried to come here to the United States to say, this is where I can be safe. This is where I can pursue that American dream. That's the kind of patriotism that we're actually missing right now in so many ways. Immigrants really do make America stronger, not just economically and not just in terms of diversity, but especially in terms of our shared endeavor to achieve our country. You know, I was at a um, naturalization ceremony that we had at the Contra Costa County Board of Supervisors uh, earlier this week. Um, and Congressman Desanye was there and he said something that really struck me. He said, America is an idea. And, and that really rang true for me because the the idea of America that's in the hearts of immigrants, that's in the hearts of the people that are coming here for a better life and to seek refuge and safety is really the America that we should all be invested in creating. Uh, and that's the signal that we need to send to the rest of the world. But the actual situation on the ground is complex and there's a lot of misinformation. So we want to actually debunk that and get to the truth. So forced displacement by the numbers. Forced displacement has doubled since 2010. Doubled, okay? It's 41 million people on the planet with forced displacement in 2010, and it's over 82 million people now. These are the highest numbers since World War II. This is a humanitarian crisis that the world has not seen since World War II happening right now. And it's happening all over and new hotspots are coming up every day, as we're saying with the news coming out of Haiti and Sri Lanka and other places where people are fleeing for their lives. This is also an issue that's very, very specifically has a disparate impact on women. One in five displaced women living in humanitarian crisis and armed conflict have experienced gender-based violence. And I can tell you that the rates of uh, femicide 
and sexual violence that we're seeing, um, we're seeing that as a very frequent issue that comes up in the cases that we're seeing for Stand Together Contra Costa, where uh, about 90% of our cases are asylum seeking family units. Um, and it is very rare to find a situation where we have a female client and there hasn't been some form of gender-based violence. Also, you'll hear these days a lot of fear mongering about uh, the crisis at the border and that we're being invaded and that these are criminals and that they're coming to commit crimes and take our jobs and you know abuse our women and all of this kind of classic fear mongering, fear stoking um, techniques. What you need to know, and this is very important, that nationally, 0.33%, so 0.33%, not 33%, but 0.33%, less than 1% of all deportation cases are based on any alleged criminal activity by immigrants, okay? Um, and of course, everybody should have the right to due process regardless of what they've been alleged to have done by crime, but the crime narratives are clearly not true and not borne out by the data. The next number here, 17%. When an asylum seeker has to present their legal defense without an attorney, they only win about 17% of the time. We already talked about how complex immigration law is. Imagine that you're fleeing with your family across the planet, risking everything, and you get to a country and you don't speak the language, and you're just going there to try to say, protect me, protect me and my children. We've been harmed and we're at risk. You don't speak the language, you don't have a law degree, you don't know the rules. It's no wonder people only win 17% of the time without an attorney. But with an attorney, the case grant rates go way, way up. And in fact, what we're seeing at Stand Together Contra Casa, I'd like to think it's because we have very skilled lawyers, which we do, but it's also because we're seeing so many really, really righteous cases come through with these asylum-seeking families. We win over 92% of our cases. So that's the difference between having a lawyer or having a support structure and having an understanding of what's going on and not. 17% versus 92%, right? Life and death. And we're not only talking about adults here. One third of the people in deportation proceedings nationally are children under the age of 18. And we see that here in Contra Costa. One third of my clients, 27% of our clients, our children. So this is a humanitarian crisis, but what you hear in the media is trying to frame it with the fear mongering in order to prevent us from having the right kind of response, a humanitarian response. So now I wanna zoom in. Um, as you know, uh, there is a incredible increase in need. And what's happening is that Border Patrol is now just dropping people off in cities, dropping them off and saying, good luck to you, okay? You've heard of the stuff that's going on with certain um, political games of Texas busing migrants to different cities and so forth. Um, but Border Patrol itself is conducting drop-offs um, they've released 13,000 migrants into San Diego streets in one month alone due to overflowing shelters. As 500 uh, refugees and asylum seekers were coming in every day to California. And these increased numbers, okay, of migrants, the response that the government has had is, well, let's increase the rate of processing these cases, which doesn't sound unreasonable by itself, right? But what we're seeing is an incredible drop in representation rates, okay? Representation rates have dropped nationally, and this is the number of people in deportation hearings that are able ultimately to find a lawyer, because normally they have to pay. They've dropped from 65% of folks represented nationally about four years ago to only 30% now nationally. Okay, so this is a real crisis. As you increase the rate of deportations, as we increase the number of asylum seekers, but we don't have a corresponding increase in legal services, obviously fewer people are going to be represented. 
And that's a lot. That's that's a real serious problem for these families that are seeking protection and for our nonprofits and our organizations and our community members that are trying to help. But fortunately, we are Californians. We are a can-do state and we are the Bay Area. And we know that we can lead the way in new models of showing how we can be welcoming and how we can provide due process and demonstrate our American values. We welcome immigrants in Contra Costa County. Um, we want you to join us. This is a photo from uh, a uh, event that we did a few years ago, trying to reach out to, to harder to reach immigrant populations, right? Where there's smaller language groups and maybe they don't get as integrated as much into the um, services and so forth. Um, and you can see a list here of so many organizations that we have in the Bay Area and in Contra Costa that are really committed to welcoming immigrants and providing immigrants and migrants with services and, and treating them like we'd expect to be treated if we were searching for help. Um, and so one of the main takeaways I want you all to take from this is don't buy into the fear mongering. Um, immigrants make us stronger. They not only make our economy stronger, but they make um, our entire American experiment stronger. And so uh, we are really excited in Contra Costa to meet the challenges of these very difficult times with collaboration and collectivism. And so what's happening right now is we're scrambling to make sure that the community knows if their cases are being transferred, trying to connect people with what limited resources there are. We're recognizing that there simply aren't enough lawyers and legal services to deal with these problems. So we're having to get very creative. And what's really emerging is something that I'm so excited about. Uh, it's uh, the organizations and community members that are wanting to respond to these humanitarian crises are developing plans for a welcoming immigrants support hub or a wish center where we would bundle services, whatever existing legal services we can bring to connect people with uh, attorneys, not only to represent their cases, but even if we can't have enough attorneys to represent clients throughout their cases, we wanna make sure that at least these community members have an opportunity to speak with an attorney about their case, to understand what's going on, to understand what are the documents that they need to provide. How should they fill out the forms if they can't have an attorney? Can we help them do that? Can we give them help translating their documents themselves? So that the 70% of people nationally that don't get lawyers in their deportation cases, how can we help them as a community, as a community defense model, defend themselves? How can we make sure that the legal services that we do have are integrated with all of the passion and uh, love and experience that we have in the community um, to connect people, welcome people, and provide a single location where they can not only get some legal assistance, but also have wraparound services, sign up for Medi-Cal, get help for your trauma that you've suffered, um, get help with housing, get help with eviction defense and so forth. A place where immigrants can go and feel safe, a place that's designed by immigrants for immigrants. Um, and a big key part of that is accompaniment, is having our community welcome these individuals and accompany them through this difficult process. And so it is my honor to present to you my friend, Reverend Deborah Lee, to talk about accompaniment and the exciting ways in which uh, we all, as members of this community, can tap in and really get involved in showing a new way. Reverend Lee has worked at the intersection of faith and social justice for over 30 years in popular education, community organizing, and advocacy connecting issues of race, gender, economic justice, anti-militarism, LGBTQ plus inclusion, and immigrant rights. I'm proud to call her a friend of mine and a mentor, and she's consist consistently sought to strengthen the voice and role of faith communities in today's social movements. Uh, through the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, which you're gonna learn a lot about, so it's my honor to present to you, Reverend Deborah Lee. Welcome. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, let me pull up my slideshow.
Uh, Reverend Lee is muted. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be here and I um, with the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. And I want to just say like how much how much the landscape has changed in Contra Costa County. And so I think even though it's it's a it's a challenge that this deportation court is now appearing here as part of our county, I do think we have built the infrastructure over the last 10 to 15 years that, you know, we're ready to meet the challenge. And so I want to thank the League of Women Voters and the many other people who've joined the webinar today for being part of this. So I'm with the Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity. Um, and this is a little bit about our mission and our work. We, we've come together as faith communities and families that are directly impacted by the system of immigration and incarceration across the state. We've been around for the last 30 years. Um, when California was going through a wave of anti-immigration immigration laws in this, in this state and this people came really came together and the faith community decided that they were going to use their voice and leverage uh, to stand with immigrants and not let anyone be excluded or stigmatized or criminalized in, in any way. So these are the things I see a lot of alignment between what you've shared about the League of Women Voters and how we approach the issue of immigration and some of the values that we share and the work that we do. So we certainly align and do a lot of work um, on many issues around advocacy together. I want to share today is a little bit more about our program of accompaniment, which is a way that we can bring volunteers together um, to, to respond, to respond to this global migration uh, moment that's happening across the world. I think every community in the world is either sending people, you know, having to say goodbye to people or communities are having to, to figure out how are they going to be welcoming people and how will they respond? And so even though we're not on the border um, uh, here in Contra Costa County, you know, we partner with many communities who are, we know those communities are doing their part. Many of the migrants and immigrants that they are uh, responding to are just trying to get through and moving on, moving into the interior. And so they're moving into the interior like places here in the Bay Area. So I think uh, this opportunity for us is to witness um, to uh, demonstrate some amount of accountability. Many migrants who are forced to leave, it's not because of anything that they did. It's because of things that are far beyond their control and their power, whether that be climate change, whether that be uh, government policies, whether that be international trade policies, um, whether that be like weapon sales and military arms, those kind of conditions that have been created without much of their say-so has really created life-altering impacts. So I wanna share, um, we have developed since 2015, kind of um, responding to different waves of people on the move, um, have developed a, a program called Nueva Esperanza Accompaniment. And we've, um, this model has changed over the years, and uh, it may be changing again as we think about how to respond in Contra Costa County and in other areas. So it's basically figuring out how do we bring volunteers together who are already stable. Yeah, you can be an immigrant yourself, or you could be someone who's been here for many generations. But to organize ourselves to accompany newly arrived immigrants in the beginning stages of resettlement of people in the US who have no other support system. Some of you may be familiar with refugee resettlement that um, a Jewish Jewish family um, for children and Jewish services for fa uh, families and children do a wonderful job of refugee resettlement. So does the International Rescue Committee. What, what we're talking about in the deportation court and in our accompaniment that we've developed are for people who don't fit into the official refugee status. They don't, they're not coming under an official government program. They don't have any kind of support at all. And they may not have agencies here that can receive people who are refugees with a small R or people who are trying to defend themselves from deportation by seeking asylum or some other kind of relief. So there's some pictures here, some recent teams. And I want to just give you an example. Like this is a this is a mother, uh, Raquel and her family, and kind of echoing 
what Ali said, like so many third, you know, one third of people being children um, who left this, left her country, uh, com came on foot, came via the top of a train through Mexico, fleeing many converging conditions um, that were converging upon herself, destroying her livelihood, her murdering her husband, kidnapping her son, but you know, her whole world kind of collapsing around her and not being able to find justice in her home country and um, realizing her life would be in danger if she did not leave. So someone who had to leave pretty much on a dime uh, and get to a place of safety and protection. So this, someone like Raquel and, and her kids might end up here. Um, it did end up here in the in 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 the Bay Area, and what we what we were asking people as accompaniment teams to do was to come around her and be able to be a support. Um, like my mother fled her country in a time of war, and she was able to go to an uncle. Well, that we're, we're what we're working with are people in specific who don't have that family to be able to go to in their time of need. Um, one thing I want to say is, uh, just let me just go back to Raquel for a second, is that, you know, we can, I want to understand that people's status as a migrant isn't like necessarily an identity. It's a, it's a transitory condition. It's a transitory experience that they're going through. So we always try to remind our volunteers like this, this, this person, this is not their sole identity. They've had a whole life before they came here. They've had a whole life getting here. They've had a whole lot of agency and and here they can we want them to still be able to bring all their skills and gifts that they can into this new situation. Understanding that there may be a lot of new things. A language might be new, how things work might be new. And so our guide is not to fix someone. The problems that Raquel is facing are deep and vast. And they're not going to be solved within one year or even five years. You know, these are some complex situations he's navigating. Our role as an accompanier's or an accompaniment team is how do we just help someone through that time of transition, whether that be three months or six months or a year, until they can best get their footing. It's not to fix, but it's really to walk alongside. And for many of us who may not have had to go through deportation court ourselves, it will be very eye-opening to us as well. So... Our goals uh, for accompaniment are really to create sanctuary by creating community around a family and to pro by providing two things on the left to providing access and connection to resources and on the right, being able to provide relationships, um, someone to listen to, someone to be an ear for, but kind of in that coaching model, not to solve or fix, but to help, help people make the best decisions that they can um, and, and supporting, as you know, you know, you've had friends, you know, who've been supportive to you. Um, our goals are at the top. You know, we want we want to uh, recognize people's self-sufficiency, move them towards self-sufficiency, especially as these numbers are increasing. We can't do the Cadillac model. You know, we have to really try to have a very focus of like a, a period of time that we can support someone. So moving them towards self-sufficiency, um, having the, having coaching in them, the sense of empowerment, there's many of them have undergone hugely disempowering experiences, being detained, being uh, at the mercy of a lot of people on their journey. So how do we encourage in them a sense of empowerment? And how do we help together change that narrative, that narrative that Ali was talking about that demonizes, stigmatizes, criminalizes immigrants? Um, you know, this, you know, but how do we bring forth this sense that changes the narrative within themselves and also changes the narrative in our wider community? So these are the kinds of resources that we identify. This is very similar to like for any of the arriving refugees that these are the kinds of resources that people need to access um, in order to get stability, to then be able to go through their deportation and asylum process, which could be a year, two years, or a number of years. But we all know people need some basic stability, even be able to, to navigate that. So one of the ways uh, we have typically worked with accompaniment teams, how am I doing on time? Um, oh, we have a, with teams of people, five or six, who will walk with a particular family. As we're looking at new models to look at in Contra Costa County, especially with the WISH Center and with the court, we may be looking at finding volunteers who can both show up to court with people, accompany them in court, be trained and accompany people in court, or be trained on any of these resources 
to be able to help navigate people, uh, you know, to, to access them. Um, partly, you know, because of COVID, we had a big drop in numbers of volunteers. So we always have way more families on our list than we have volunteers able to commit to do a team. So we're looking at other models of like specialized volunteers. And I just want to lift up, you know, a big goal of accompaniment is also about, um, you know, th they can be an avenue for healing and healing uh, for the, those who have been directly impacted, um, ways that they can see themselves, they can really be able to believe that they can start this new chapter, that they can make it, uh, where they can start to express their vision for the future. Um, and a place where through relationship, they can have a place to process some of what they've gone through. And I want to say it's also very healing for those who are on the accompaniment side, because we have been, um, we've been separated. We've been really separated, you know, like almost like an, a, a, a wall has been between um, sometimes newly arrived immigrants and those of us who have been here a long time. We've been separated by detention centers. We've been separated by a wall. Sometimes we're separated by language, but the possibilities for more uh, human understanding and deepening our own humanity are there. So uh, since 2015, we've worked with more than 20 congregations who have accompanied people and over 200 people have been accompanied from these various countries. And then the lineup of countries almost changes every six months. So I want to give you a chance to hear from someone who has been one of those accompaniers and uh, Suzanne Llewellyn, and I'll stop my share. And I want to, uh, I've invited Suzanne to share a little bit about what, what she's learned or how accompaniment has impacted her life. Okay, let me see if I can get my camera adjusted better. <laughs> um, I live in Walnut Creek, and um, I'm retired, and I decided I wanted to do volunteer work. Um, and I am a member of the Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church. Uh, it's very helpful um, to be affiliated with um, an organization that can be the source of other volunteers to come together as a team. And uh, I am just thrilled to hear Ali say that there's going to be this hub with wraparound services because most of us who serve on teams, my experience anyway, is that we um, are very privileged and we have not had to figure out how to use the food bank or how to get a social security number when there's a wrong digit on on your card or something um how to you know find housing in this market because most of us you know are settled um and so forth and um so it's a it's a big challenge for the team members to uh, have to learn the system themselves in order to be able to be helpful in accompanying someone. Um, and I, I really agree that it's very important that um, Americans uh, learn from personal experience what's going on with our immigration system, since it's it's the practically the number one political issue in our country, you know, next to abortion or something. But um, if you don't understand that our immigration system is broken and that um, people are fleeing situations that, as Deb said, they have had no uh, control over and that may not necessarily meet that international treaty that uh, Lee referenced um, regarding um, you know, exactly what it takes to be a true asylum seeker or refugee. Um, many of those people come through the route where they get vetted and, and chosen as a refugee before they come into this country. But many of these people that we're trying to help have had to flee under, you know, shockingly uh, terrible conditions, such as the one Deborah uh, described with Raquel, where there's no time to think or apply or, you know, do something. So, um I have to say that it's a very rewarding experience, but it's also a very challenging one. And um, it's important to have a very strong, very committed team 
so that you can divvy up all the um the the tasks and i would say the number one task is housing so uh and housing is extremely difficult to find and again that's where your church might be useful in terms of um in, if uh, for example in in contra costa county there's something called winter nights and we were able to place a woman with two children a single mom with two children in winter nights where every two weeks she's housed in a different church uh, for all but the summer. Now we're up against the summer coming on us and we have to find another alternative, but at least that carried us through for the first six months. Um, and then uh, finding um, employment when you don't have a great, you know, a, a, a permission to, to work is, is a huge um, challenge. And, uh, you know, you have to learn as a team member that, um, uh, people can't, and even the courts understand that somebody can't survive without working. And I've heard, you know, that they kind of, they don't um, hold that against an immigrant in the way that you might suspect they would. Uh, but nevertheless, um, the system is just so broken that, um, well, and the other, I guess, in terms of, you know, it's so broken and so complex, as Ali said, that as a, as a team member, you can't possibly understand it all. And in fact, you're not supposed to give legal advice, but you're faced with uh, immigrants who have to make a legal decision, you know, uh, whether they're, they're going to fly to New York City because that's where their court venue is, even though right now they're in San Francisco and they have to make that decision. You can't, you're not their legal advisor. Um, so, um, you know, it, it's a very, um, I'd say heartwarming experience to be able to help somebody in this way, but it is also very challenging. So I'll leave it right there. And if anybody has questions that I'm happy to. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And I want to thank you for your years of accompanying many different families. And I want to, you lifted up the legal thing. And I think that's why it's been so important for the accompaniments to be able to partner with legal. And I feel like the possibilities for us to be able to partner where we can with the Contra Costa Stands attorneys, when we can, you know, when we already have an attorney that's working with a family or something like that, and the housing would be a very important part of the equation. I want to give us time to hear from Justin, who is somebody who has been accompanied actually by Suzanne and others. And um, let Justin say a few words about his own experience and what uh, being accompanied, the importance of accompaniment and being accompanied at that critical time in his life. Justin, can you show your yourself on camera, please? It's, um, it says I can't um, start the video. I think the host has to, um, you cannot start your video because the host has disabled it. We need to make him a co-host. I've done that. Go ahead, Justin. Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Yeah. My name is Justin Esimonio, and um, thank you for having me, Deb. Um, I arrived in the United States in um, May of um, 2000 and, um, 2017, and um, then it was a little bit of, um, you know, a lot was going on in the country. So when I arrived in the country, I... Um, Landed at San Francisco Airport and I was um, taken into detention. Um, and I didn't really know anybody here. Um, I was coming on a B1, B2 visa. Um, my visa was revoked at the airport and then I got, um, I was taken into detention. But um, at detention, I was writing letters to faith communities and um, one of the people that visited us while we were in detention told me about interfaith movement of human integrity. And then I wrote a letter. I wrote a letter. The first letter I wrote, I think it got missing. They didn't get it. 
And then the second letter, they eventually got it. And that was how Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity was able to connect me to a sponsorship church, which, church, which is on the Mount Diablo Universal Unitarian in Walnut Creek. And, and that is my sponsorship church. They sponsored me. Um, my sponsors were Joe and Meek. And um, by them offering, I spent six months in detention and I just didn't have no hope of coming, getting out of detention. But with my sponsors offering um, that they will accommodate me and that they will make sure that I appear for all my court immigration hearings, um, I was granted a bond and a bail. So Interfaith helped me to raise my bond. And then the role my accompaniment team played was helping me to really get stabilized in the community. My accompaniment team helped me with housing. They helped me to get around until I got my driver's license. They helped me with many other jobs too, until I was able to get a work permit and able to find for myself. So my accompaniment team, it was really an advantage and a great help having them. Um, Suzanne, Suzanne Lewellyn was also there. She was one of those who really um, helped me get into the community, get me get stabilized, um, helped me with jobs, helped me, you know, with just getting around. So the role the accompaniment team play, played was really good because then I had a group of people that I could always go to whenever I had a question. And if Mr. A was busy, Miss B could be, you know, willing to help. So that was really helpful. And that kind of gave me a sense of belonging, having people around me that could help. And um, and then, yeah, I I was eventually able to um, get my work permit through the support of my accompaniment team. I was able to get a good attorney, immigration attorney that um, did support and help my case. And, um, and yeah, and I feel like right now, I feel like I'm fully stabilized. I was able to, um, I, in 2022, um, no, yeah, 2022, I was able to win my, um, November 2022, I won my asylum and, um, I have applied for my green card and, um, things are looking much more better. And thanks to Interfaith, thanks to, um, all of you that have been supporting immigration and doing all, a lot of things for immigration. Thanks to Suzanne, Llewellyn and all of you. So that's a little bit of my story. And then the role that I, the accompaniment team played in my life, they really did a lot for me, just um, from the detention and then getting to my feet, you know, it was um, a big, a huge support. And uh, I really do appreciate it. Thanks so much, Justin. I love seeing your smile when you talked about finally getting asylum. <laughs> So Justin also is now actually putting other people to work. He actually has a small a business in Contra Costa County and definitely a, a shining resident. Uh, actually, Mark DeSalni invited Justin to attend the State of the Union address in Washington, D.C. a couple years ago as a representative with him of this county. Um, I, I want to just share a few. I, when we're going to get to questions, and probably Ali will want to say a few things to wrap up. But let me just go back to how you know what the invitation is for you to consider and oh you see okay so we talked about let me let me go back to a company we talked about accompaniment um and so if you are interested in learning more about accompaniment perhaps coming to an accompaniment orientation um we would love for you to let us know that and i think there's a way you can do that in the chat something like that. You could put your email in there. Um, you can also contact um, our accompaniment manager. Her name is Kelly. And I think someone will be putting her contact info in the chat, as well as links to our website, which has training materials and much more than what I shared today. Um, again, we were working with accompaniment teams. You can. We're also exploring accompaniment solo volunteers who might be able to accompany for a specific for specific jobs, not on a team. So we're expanding what accompaniment might look like with the Wish Center. The other important thing you heard that's part of the uh, equation is housing, and this is temporary housing that would could be in a private home an in-law unit, apartment building. You may have an Airbnb that you have that's available for a short amount of time. Um, 
free or reduced costs for three to six months makes a, makes all the difference in the world. As you know, we as you heard from Suzanne's example, we're having to find shelter space for people and the shelters are full. So um, that's just uh, one uh, other really critical piece of this. Uh, we also have a number, there are a number of congregations who have converted a space or they had a space that could be used for respite housing. Again, temporary short-term housing, sometimes as little as a month. Um, one congregation has made their space available for one month stays only, and they've housed 27 different people over the last few years, which has made a huge difference. Um, some have added a shower, some have not had to add, add anything. So there's a number who, who have added none to, that I know of yet in Contra Costa County, but we are looking for other, any little spaces we can get. And then um, there's also this issue of sponsorship or paper sponsors to help people get out of immigrant detention centers. They do need someone to, an American citizen to vouch for them. So this is where many of us can use our privilege or uh, to sponsor people who, family members of people who are here who are, or people from four countries. There's a special program that's been created called Humanitarian Parole from people from Nicaragua, Haiti, Venezuela, and Cuba. Um, and we we already have done like 50 people who have who have done the paperwork in order for someone there to come, not necessarily to do the accompaniment because they already have family here, but their own family cannot sponsor them because they don't have the citizenship status. So those are other ways that other kinds of ways, opportunities to volunteer. And we're all also involved in advocacy. And so um, we have a monthly call that talks about advocacy because we're besides reducing the harm that our immigration systems create, we're trying to look at how can we really transform them as well. So I'll pause there and see if Ali wants to give some final words and lead us into the Q&A. I, I want to sign up. Um, so I'm very excited about um, about everything that you all are doing. And I just want to say that Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity is critical. And as an immigration attorney, um, we are doing, you know, for the limited number of people that we can represent, we're only providing so much. But that welcoming, that belonging, you heard from Justin about having that sense of belonging that people here want you here and want to help you. Um, that's just so critical. And so I'm so grateful for the work that Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity does. And I'm really excited for them to be key partners in the kind of design of the future of accompaniment. And as, as Reverend Deb said, how can we uh, reduce the harms while working hard to change the system? Great. So Ali, you ready to try to answer some of those questions? Sure, sure. I'll I'll look at some of these questions from here. Um uh and and you know others jump in as well. Uh let me see some of them. Okay. So here's one. Um there's a question about um work permits. I saw a question about work permits earlier. Um and is it true that migrants cannot obtain a work permit for six months? How can they support themselves? Is this what nonprofits do? Excellent question. So um, we got to be clear about our terms. So uh, what the question seems to be targeted at is asylum seekers. And as I said, right now, that's the overwhelming majority of um, migrants that we're seeing in our program. Um, and so when you're seeking asylum in immigration court, uh, you do not have the right to a work permit. You have to wait for six months until after you've actually filed that first application. Okay, so it's not even when they place you into deportation proceedings, it's when you actually file that application. So let's say they place you into deportation proceedings, but you don't have a lawyer. So you show up to court and you say, please give me more time, I need a lawyer. And then they say, okay, come back in a month. That month doesn't count. Until you actually file that application, that starts a clock for six months. And only after that six months is up, can you then uh, be eligible to receive your work permit? Um, yeah, it doesn't make any sense. I agree with the, the premise of the questioner and what nonprofits do, that's exactly what Reverend Deb is talking about is how can we accompany folks that are facing all of these intersectional barriers to, to work, 
to getting food on the table, to having a house, a place to stay, but also just how to navigate and feel that welcoming and belonging. That's one question. Um, let me look at some others here. Older the cases seen at the new court mm. are the cases uh, heard that the people been in the country for a long time and are kids handled differently at, mm. at the new court? Great question. Um, so the age of the cases really does does vary. And at the new court, uh, we don't have all of that. I don't have that data right now um, for how old the cases are. There's a great website that's put out by Syracuse University um, that collects all the data. It's Syracuse Track, T-R-A-C. And that really has uh, a ton of data. And that's where I got most of the data that I presented during the presentation. So you can get granular and kind of key into specific deportation courts, but because this one has only been open for so long, I don't think their data is up yet. Um, but in terms of the second part of the question, which was uh, how old are they? And what was the second part, Susan? Kids treated, do they get oh. representation? So if you're an unaccompanied minor, so if a child presents themselves by them by themselves, then there are mechanisms under the immigration law for the federal government to provide um, representation for those children. But the children that, for example, we're representing through the Stand Together Contra Costa program, if you've come in with a family unit and you're not unaccompanied, meaning you're not alone, and your case is kind of attached generally to your parents' case or the family unit's case. And in those cases, the federal government doesn't doesn't um, provide an attorney for the individual. Um, and so that's where we depend on um, the nonprofits. Or uh, again, the nonprofits can't approach representing everybody. So really it's a community defense plan that we need to come up with. So how can these individuals be supported enough to be able to put their best foot forward, even if they don't have an attorney at the end of the day. And someone asked, could I, as a non-interested party, observe um, a, a case or a hearing in the deportation court? Yes, there are certain certain hearings that you can, as, as a member of the public, come and observe. There are some types of proceedings that uh, it's up to, there's privacy concerns, and so it's up to the asylum seeker to decide who they want to be into that kind of final hearing where they have to testify and everything. Um, so you can't go to all of the hearings, but there are hearings that you can go to. And if you're part of an accompaniment team and the individual wants you at that hearing, which generally that would be the case, um, you can go. And then I see a question, if you only speak English, can you still be part of a team or an individual who assists with accompaniment? That's for you, Reverend Deb. Absolutely. Our uh, immigrants uh, come in all languages. And so there's actually a need. Um, we've had a lot of different needs of different languages. And usually if, if you are part of a team, you know, at least one person needs to be, you know, be able to communicate, but there are other roles that team members can play. There was a question about training. Is there any kind of training that, um... The folks who are know they have to go to deportation court. Is there any way where that we can help them understand all the things they need to know or do? That's a great. That's a great question. That's kind of what we're trying to get at. Um, oh, good. The, the court does provide very limited kind of materials. Usually, it's a list of nonprofits to call and some instructional sheets in a couple of languages for like how to fill out certain forms. But in terms of actually training folks on how to deal with this, that's what we need a community response for. And that's a big part of what we're really um, wanting to see at the at the WISH Center, if we can make it happen. Reverend Deb, did you have anything to add to that one? No? Okay. All right. Okay. We're trying to manage all these questions and uh, panelists, uh, I'm trying to put them in the chat as quick as they come in, or you can look at them on the Q&A because most of the questions are sure. still here on the Q&A. No problem. Um, I see another one here. Can I tell you about Court Watch? So Court Watch, uh, there's different Court Watch programs. Uh, as we just described, there's different, you know, different hearings are open to the public. And in fact, one of the things that uh, we do want to try to coordinate at the new deportation court is um, 
trainings for folks, hopefully if we get this WISH Center up and running at the WISH Center, where we can educate community members about kind of what goes on in court. So you don't go in kind of blind, you have a little bit of context of what's what's happening. Um, and and then to, to tap folks into that. Um, we've already been reached out to by the National Lawyers Guild and some others. Sometimes they use students or law students, but we really want community members like you all um, that are civically engaged to be involved in court watch programs. Good, and we also wanted to make sure, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Reverend Deb, just a second. We wanted to make sure that all the folks who are participating in the webinar, you're gonna receive a resource list after the webinar, and that will give you information how to volunteer and information about all the organizations we've been talking about today. So did you wanna make an additional comment, um, Reverend Deb? Oh, I just wanted to let people know, Suzanne and Justin, we're still here too, so people had any questions for them. Um, I. Uh, this is Suzanne, and I um, wanted to, Deb to mention that the interfaith movement does provide training for accompaniment teams, um, so that it's very instrumental in being able to be successful doing that. Yes, yes, we do. We do. Yeah, we do have uh, a training. And I think even if we were, even if we were, you know, Ali and I are talking about what were the different models like court accompaniment or driving accompaniment, you know, like even for something that seems so simple, driving someone from point A to point B, we still feel like the training is really important. Uh, we certainly don't want to re-traumatize people and, you know, even by like questions or things like that. And so, um, you know, so those are things that we, you know, we've been learning a lot. We started doing this accompaniment in 2015. It's like almost 10 years, you know, and we've been trying to learn and adapt and get feedback and having to adapt and learning from other places in the country who are doing this. You know, there are robust accompaniment programs in in Texas and Austin and Boston. I mean, all over in, in the Northwest. Um, and I know that the communities like Chicago and New York and DC that have received thousands of migrants over the last year or two, they've had to, you know, figure out other other ways of doing things. So we're trying to be very flexible and thinking about what's going to work best in Contra Costa County um, around this new court. So I don't and, know, Justin. Yeah, just there's that interesting, uh, as two similar questions here. Is there any interest or discussion of partnership with local community college students social work or law students to help on the teams that that is that would be great and i and i do want to say like even if you don't have a whole team you know our model is really based on congregations because as suzanne said they can lean into the whole congregation to find the car seat or to find you know resources that might be needed um, if, if you're just a solo volunteer, we are looking for ways for solo volunteers to to also accompany and to support in, in some very specific ways. So you don't have to have a team. I think if you just have a desire, we can figure out, you know, where are your gifts and where, do, where does that lie and, and, and how it could work. I think we've answered most of the questions we have here. We certainly could have a few more from our wonderful experts and volunteers, Suzanne and Justin. So great that we were able to hear from them. Well, while we're waiting for other questions, I see that there's a question about community college students and providing this presentation in colleges. Um, we we do partner uh, quite a bit with our local community colleges. Stand Together Contra Costa does. We regularly do events there. And part of the model here that we're hoping to do with the Wish Center is really try to find ways to make sure that we're getting a good cross section of our community to be involved and find out what's going on, right? Um, and so whether it's through your congregation, whether it's through your school, whether it's youth, whether it's um, retired folks, um, this is something that really is uh, part of the fabric of our community and we have a real opportunity um, to model a different way for dealing with these humanitarian challenges in a way that is um, not only humane, but is transformational for not only the folks that we're helping, but for our whole entire community. Because when we promote human rights here at home, uh, that's a healing act, and that's an act of 
creation and that's an act toward achieving our country. So I'm just so excited about um, getting as many folks involved as possible, especially young folks. And we do intend on uh, specifically reaching out to the community colleges, uh, especially for the court watch components so that we can educate youth about what happens in these centers and then equip them to uh, tap in. There is a question about presentations in high schools. Are you doing anything in the high schools? I think I'm stand stand together. You can you can answer. Um, we've done a few, especially some of the uh, private high schools have invited us to do presentations. Uh, we had uh, some youth who's sharing their experiences and stories. It's more just a capacity issue. We're <laughs> we're all, including Ali's operation, we're all very small and stretched. So we're not opposed to it. It's just a matter of, you know, capacity. So Reverend Deb, you might be able to answer this question. Um, this in, uh, person is, a, I'm on an accompaniment team at Mount Diablo Unitarian Universalist Church, which has gotten a lot of shouts out today. <laughs> the immigrant in our team speaks English very well. I'd like to volunteer tutor an immigrant who needs help with speaking English. Where should I reach out? Um, this person happens to live in Concord. How, how would they make that connection? Ali, what, where would you recommend them out there? Does tutoring? Um, you know, the the I think that actually our libraries have some good uh like ESL stuff that you might be able to tap into. So do the community colleges. You might be able to like volunteer as a tutor with some of the ESL programs that that exist. Um and uh so that's I yeah, that's, maybe ref there I would also maybe mention refugee transitions. Mm -hmm. Just focus on tutoring. And I think, um, you know, maybe the International Rescue Committee, mm -hmm. you know, that could give you, I don't know if Monument has a tutoring program or not, but of course they're in Monument Impact. I, I can answer the question for the person on our team, uh, because I have a friend who is tutoring uh, in Contra Costa County, so she can check with me. Okay. <laughs> And just a couple of questions are still coming in. Uh, because this is a project of the Contra Costa County Library, I'm just going to shout out Project um, Second Chance is a great program for one-on-one -on -one adult literacy training, Project Second Chance. And we can even put that on the resource list. Here's a question um, for, um, I think, you, Ali, or uh, how many different positions do you have for volunteers, or maybe you, Reverend Deb, as well? How do you qualify the volunteer for a specific position? Is that a tough one? <laughs> well, I, 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 it's only tough. You know, it's like an unlimited, <laughs> an unlimited need um, uh, of volunteers. But also, I think it's just because we're just kind of starting up our volunteer recruitment around the emergence of the new center, right? And so we're actually like in this new phase of kind of doing outreach and 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 seeing like what's going, what's the, will be the community response to accompaniment volunteers. So at this point, you know, we are we're trying to gauge interest. And so I, you know, if you can do that, um, you could respond. My staff member, Kelly, who's not here, is probably going to get a whole bunch of emails tomorrow, but we need to know who you are because this is a webinar format. We can't, we don't, we can't even see you. Um, so we need to know who you are and if you're interested, what your interests are, if you want to share a little bit about what skills you think you, you bring or could offer, that would be helpful too. And then we're going to kind of assess assess what you know how we can begin this endeavor anew in Contra Costa County. It's great and just to uh, make sure everybody knows there will be rec a recording of this webinar and it will be shown uh, on uh, cable TV or I mean the Contra Costa TV as well as the YouTube channels of the library and Diablo Valley League. Now um, this is an interesting question I think Ali where are WISH Center funding sources, how can folks advocate for funding this great enterprise? That's a TBD, uh, <laughs> but you can always advocate. So, um, you know, the, the WISH Center is not, uh, that is not a county program, that this is something that, uh, there was a big uh, immigrant, East Bay immigrant convening uh, last late last year in November, 
Um, and emerging from that, from the organizations and community members were the seeds of uh, this concept. And we're still uh, at the drawing board right now. So we don't really have a full development plan yet because we don't want to we don't want to design to match a certain dollar amount. We want to design for efficacy and then figure out the uh, the funding and, and which organizations are going to do what parts. Um, but we definitely will need help advocating for that um, when the time comes. Um, and so, you know, paying attention to what the um, Contra Costa Immigrant Rights Alliance is, is doing on that front or organizations like Centro Legal de la Raza or the California Collaborative for Immigrant Justice. Um, so stay tuned, uh, but we definitely will need help with resourcing. And then on the volunteer question, I just wanted to add, if anybody's interested, don't self-select out. Um, everybody is part of this community and has a way to contribute. And so please go ahead and reach out and um, and see if it's for you and and get to know get to know the folks that are doing this work. Um, and if nothing else, I guarantee you'll meet some really passionate um, people that care about our community. And we have talked about a lot of different agencies. We'll try to clarify on our resource list that we're sending out who's doing what, because I know one of our participants is <laughs> a little confused, but we want to make sure everybody knows what's going on. But here, I think, is a really uh, good question, and maybe you folks could sum up after that. How are family cases treated? Are the decisions treated as individual members or the family as a whole? Uh, for example, what happens? Is family separation occur because of a deportation order of one of the family members? That's a So yes, that does happen frequently, all too frequently, um, sadly. Uh, but there's not really a one size fits all situation depending on the underlying nature of the case. And again, this is where an immigration lawyer really helps. Um, you know, your, your family members might be beneficiaries under the same theory under which one family member is seeking asylum. But sometimes we'll, we'll see, you know, the, the one person might have a political opinion based claim for asylum because they were, jailed or tortured or something based on expressing their political opinion. And another member of the family might have a gender-based um, you know, claim. And so th it, there's not an easy answer to that question, but yes, uh, family separation happens all too often. And uh, even with a case where we're representing the entire family unit, um, it is possible depending on the specific case to prevail for certain family members and not for others. Okay. And it's well, heartbreaking. Or, um, would you, would either of you like, or maybe Justin, would anyone like to make a few closing comments? Because we got a minute left before we go into our um, actual closing information. Please go ahead if you'd like to make any comments. Justin, did you want to share something? We haven't been seeing you. Looks good to see your smiling face. Yes. I mean, the main thing I would like to share is the hope. Um, for me, what was really big while in detention was the hope. I was there for six months and I lost hope, kind of. And then the day that I received that letter from Interfaith and from MDUUC saying that they got a sponsor for me, um, I can remember vividly how I felt, you know. Um, so I think the accompaniment team kind of give the immigrant kind of hope that you're not standing all by yourself. You're not alone. You have people supporting you. You have a team with you. And um, I really did benefit from it. I did. From housing to transportation to work permit to getting stabilized, I did benefit from it. And it's really a good thing. And I am still grateful. And I will urge that we all support, you know, uh, immigrants. Thank you so much. All right. Well, any Reverend Deb, another final comment? Okay. I just want to say, and I and we want to enlist Justin in helping us design this, you know, this next phase of the work in Contra Costa County. 
now that he's more stable. But thank you so much for sharing your words. And thank you so much, Suzanne, for showing people that it can be done. And you've just done an amazing job over this last decade of work. Um, we didn't even talk about your work on root causes and the detention centers. And, um, you know, I just want to invite people like this is our, you know, immigration can feel really big and it's just an opportunity to do something very small that can very powerfully give someone a sense of hope. And you can never imagine what that could mean, but something very small and very local. Thank you so much. We're about ready to go to our closing slides, but one of our team members, Sean Gilbert, has her hand up. Sean, did you want to make a comment? You're muted, Sean. Thank you so much. I really appreciated Justin's comment about hope because um, that's what we all really want to hold on to. So thank you, Justin. Okay, well, thanks, panel. Now we're going to go to our closing slides. Here we go. And this, of course, is our um, the, our, our visual for this this amazing conversation we had today. On behalf of the League of Women Voters, Diablo Valley, the League of Women Voters, West Contra Costa County, Contra Costa Library, and CCTV, I want to extend a genuine thank you to each of our panelists for being here today to offer such an informative and timely conversation. And here are our panelists. I'd first like to thank Ali Saadi, who is amazing, and we're so glad to have him on our team. Thank you so much, Ali. Also, thank you, Reverend Deborah Lee. She is amazing. I've heard so much about her. Pamela, our interpreter. Thank you, Pamela. And I really do want to also mention Justin Esamonu. I hope I'm saying that correctly. And Suzanne Llewellyn, thank you so much for being with us and our audience for attending today and for the important questions they have asked us. Again, pa Pamela is providing the Spanish interpretation of today's webinar and the Interpretation is jointly funded by Contra Costa Library and the League of Women Voters, the Ablo Valley. Now for our next slide, we have our community conversation webinars, the deportation and courts promoting human rights at home will be rebroadcast. And here it is, folks. We've had a lot of questions about this on CCTV on the following days and times. The 21st at four, that's today, Tuesday, the 26th at seven, Thursday, the 28th at four, Sunday the 31st at 11, Tuesday, April 2nd at 7, Sunday, April 7th at 11 a.m. And as you can see here, we have the YouTube links as well. Um, you can see those there, and you will be able to see this on League of Women Va Voters Diablo Valley and Contra Costa Library. And finally, our next conversation that's coming up, please save the date for the community conversation on April 18th at four o'clock, the fight for clean air, industrial pollutants in Contra Costa County. And Community Conversations is a program, it's a partnership between League, League of Women Voters Diablo Valley, uh, West Contra Costa County, the library and CCTV. And the League of Women Voters, as we've said, is a nonpartisan organization encouraging informed and active participation in government. The League never endorses or opposes candidates or political parties. We influence public policy through education and advocacy. We invite you to join us and you can see our link right there. Thank you, everybody. It's been a wonderful uh, program, and we hope you learned a lot and you'll get involved to support um, our communities here. Thank you. Diane, you can go ahead and end the webinar. Albert, where do you want me to do that? Should be bottom right-hand corner. It should be end. Yes, thank you.